So let's find out why the Falcon 9 booster failed at landing on the drone ship in the last Starlink mission. And when will we finally witness the first launch of American astronauts to the ISS from US soil in almost a decade? And let's of course also take a look at the current developments of Starship at Boca Chica. Then over at NASA, the SLS production is standing still due to the crisis and another area has been found where SLS has massive cost and time overruns. At least the Mars 2020 rover seems to be still on track for a launch in July this year. And NASA released a new list of spin-off technologies from space exploration, which the anti-space flight proponents should take a really good look at. And NASA is also toying with the idea of a Venus surface exploration mission. Apart from the US, the Chinese Long March 7A rocket unfortunately failed its first mission. And Russia is planning a new moon lander, the first in 45 years. Quite a lot to talk about today, so stay tuned! So the last Starlink mission on the 18th of March ended as we know only in partial success. The 60 Starlink satellites were successfully deployed to orbit, which is really good news, because now the total number of functioning Starlink satellites has been increased to 350. At 400 satellites, minor coverage of North America can already be provided, and at 800, which should be reached by the end of the year, we will have moderate coverage of North America. So by the end of the year, we probably will see Starlink go online in the US and Canada. However, the Falcon 9B1048 booster, which was a Block 5 booster, so the newest iteration of the Falcon 9 rocket, was unfortunately lost. The cause for this was a premature engine shutdown already 2 minutes and 22 seconds after liftoff. One of the 9 Merlin engines apparently malfunctioned or better violently failed so that it was instantly cut off in order to prevent damage to the other engines. To compensate for this engine loss, the other engines had to burn longer in order to successfully deploy the Starlink satellites to their designated orbit. Now of course with one engine less the landing maneuver was very likely to fail. The atmospheric re-entry was probably a lot more extreme and the booster might have ran out of propellant before it could complete its drone ship landing burn. It is also possible that the failed engine was one of the three engines which controlled the re-entry and landing, therefore the rocket wouldn't have been able to compensate for this loss. It probably hit the ocean at supersonic speeds, obliterating it into thousands of pieces. But the B-1048 booster had a successful career and had already successfully flown four times before. Still, the loss is not so good and Elon ordered a thorough investigation. With another rocket that SpaceX lost only a few weeks ago, the Falcon 9 arsenal has shrunk quite a lot, which will probably have a negative impact on the timeline for their upcoming commercial launches. There now remain only three flight-worthy Falcon 9 boosters, which are already assigned to critical Air Force and NASA missions. Now we hope SpaceX will get their problems under control as soon as possible, because their core business still is the Falcon 9. And one of the critical missions will of course be the first crewed flight to the ISS from American soil in almost a decade, with the SpaceX Demo 2 mission. It will be the first crewed flight on a Falcon 9 with a Crew Dragon capsule. According to the latest statements from NASA and SpaceX, the launch will take place in mid to end of May, with the current crisis apparently not negatively affecting the launch date. Now we don't want to brag or anything, but we already predicted last year in September, in this video here, that the Demo 2 mission would probably launch in mid 2020. Quite a few people accused us of being too pessimistic, there were even people seriously suggesting that Demo 2 would still take place in 2019. Now you know that we are total SpaceX fans, but we should also kind of remain realistic when assessing possible future launch dates. Now let's take a look at Starship. What's the current status of the development at Boca Chica? Production there seems yet still unaffected by the crisis. By the way, if you are wondering why we are not calling a spade a spade with this virus stuff, ask YouTube. They are demonetizing all videos that mention the virus by its name. Anyways, the heroes at Boca Chica are soldiering on despite the crisis. And the Starship SN3 prototype is making great progress. 
we remember that the SN2 acted as a pressure test article. Passing the cryogenic pressure test, though we don't know the exact maximum pressure it reached, probably somewhere between 7 and 8.5 bar. Now the Starship SN3 is taking over, which means that a Raptor engine will soon be installed. Elon even hinted that short test flights would be possible with the Starship SN3. According to the latest footage from Boca Chica, the installation of the first Raptor engine will begin very soon. After that, we will see wet dress rehearsals, and after that, static fire tests. And then with some luck, we could already see short test flights within one or two weeks. So while the people at Boca Chica work on like absolute machines, NASA facilities have in contrast already completely shut down operations, which means that work on the SLS and the Orion capsule is also standing still. Not that this would be a big difference from the regular days. A rocket that is already billions over budget and probably five years too late. So what's a few weeks more of standstill, right? We are not sure by how much the current crisis will delay the SLS and Orion flights. Artemis 1 had already been delayed before the outbreak of the pandemic in the US, from late this year to late 2021. At least Douglas Lovaro decided recently not to include the lunar gateway to the Artemis 3 moon landing, the crewed moon landing in 2024. But of course, this crisis situation now could also affect the whole Artemis timeline. In case we really enter a global recession, it's unfortunately highly doubtful that NASA would receive enough funding to pull off the Artemis 3 mission already by 2024. As sad as it is, because we know that NASA needs $30 billion in additional funding, which is reflected in the budget request for the years between 2021 and 2025. All of these years would have seen a big increase in NASA's funding. In fact, the biggest budget increase since the late 80s. But should the world really enter a recession? It's highly unlikely that NASA will receive enough money to pull off Artemis 3 already by 2024. This is just our estimate, so please don't take it as a fact. And we also don't know yet if we will really enter a global recession, or the crisis will be over sooner than we expected. Of course, we are hoping for the best, because we really want to see astronauts return to the moon as soon as possible. But okay, we guess that if Artemis won't make it, SpaceX will certainly do private moon landing missions in the 2020s with Starship, with or without NASA. And by the way, just to show how insanely money is actually being wasted over at the Artemis program, a new report by NASA's Office of Inspector General found that the mobile launcher, which will carry the SLS Block 1 from the assembly facility to the launch pad, will cost almost a whopping $1 billion. 927 million to be precise. Yes, you heard that right. Almost $1 billion for a mobile launcher. The mobile launcher ML-1, which already had been constructed for the Constellation program, which as we know was cancelled by Obama back in 2010, thanks Obama, but since this mobile launcher was only designed for the smaller Ares rockets, it needed modifications for it to be able to carry the much heavier SLS. NASA thus conducted a study that it would cost only $54 million to modify the launcher. <laughs> but by 2014, the cost had already increased to $384.7 million. And now NASA is estimating that it will cost even more, the number now standing at $692.8 million. Really nice. One billion only for a mobile launcher platform. And the ML-1 will only be able to transport SLS Block 1, so Artemis missions 1 to 3 or maximum 4. After that, a more capable mobile launcher will be needed to transport the heavier SLS Block 1B. But don't worry, because the projected cost for the mobile launcher ML-2 is only $486 million. There certainly won't be budget overruns this time, right? <laughs> Spending billions on mobile launchers. That money would have been more wisely invested into SpaceX, because with that money, SpaceX would have already probably built us a freaking moon base. 
NASA should really start spending its money more effectively. But of course, if you hire contractors such as Boeing and similarly ineffective companies, then what can you expect? At least the Mars 2020 rover doesn't seem to be affected by the current health crisis. The rover, by the way, now also has a name, Perseverance, and it's still set to launch on the 17th of July. Let's hope that this date will remain unchanged. We are excited about this mission because it will search for signs of past Martian life in the G0 crater, which is thought to have been an ancient riverbed, so a spot where if Martian life existed, ancient fossils could be well preserved. And what's also quite amazing about this mission is that the rover will carry a small flying drone with it, which will for the first time ever be able to explore Mars from above. It's called the Helicopter Scout, can fly up to 300 meters per flight and up to 10 meters high with a maximum flight duration of 90 seconds, once per day. After that, the battery will need to be recharged through the drone's solar cells. The flying drone also has two cameras on board, which will provide high-resolution images. And we really can't wait to see the images provided from this new perspective. It will be absolutely fascinating. This is where NASA shines. They might not be the best at human spaceflight anymore. SpaceX is taking over that domain. But NASA still does amazing robotic missions. And now they are apparently also toying with the idea of exploring the surface of Venus. Now we both love Venus a lot. It's a highly intriguing planet. From the outside, looking like the sister planet of Earth. It's in reality a scorching hellscape with a surface temperature of 480 degrees Celsius and a gigantic pressure of 90 times Earth atmospheric pressure. It's a perfect showcase of what happens if too much greenhouse gas accumulates in the atmosphere. You know, for all those people who say that CO2 cannot have such a big impact on global warming. Look at Venus, the atmosphere is purely CO2. And this leads to an insane greenhouse effect, which raises the temperature by around 540 degrees Celsius. Indeed, without this dense atmosphere, Venus would have a surface temperature of minus 46 degrees Celsius or 227 Kelvin. So yeah, CO2 does have an insane effect on the temperature of a planet. The last time that a surface probe touched the surface of Venus was back in 1982 with Venera 13. It transmitted images from the surface for around two hours before being fried and crushed at the same time. This here is a reconstruction of the images taken by that probe. The upper atmosphere could, by the way, be a highly interesting spot for future colonization, because there the temperature and pressure could be similar to Earth's surface conditions. And Venus offers 90% of Earth's gravity, which is really good against bone and muscle loss. And the dense atmosphere will even shield against cosmic rays. To make all this even more fascinating, there are many studies out there coming to the conclusion that it's very likely that Venus once had oceans and was very Earth-like, possibly even supporting life. So NASA probably realized that they didn't give Venus the love it deserves. So now they are toying with the idea of sending new probes to the surface of Venus. And because electric circuits are fried very fast in this extreme environment, they think of building automata which would only employ mechanical clockwork to propel the robot. Such an automation would be completely self-operating without any sensitive electronic components. In that case, rovers would survive weeks, even months in that hostile environment, which would certainly yield a lot more amazing scientific discoveries. And to all these news of space exploration, some people say, why spend so much money on space exploration when we have so many problems here on Earth? You know, this is one of our favorite arguments. We love it. We just, we just love it. For these people, NASA released a list of spin-off technologies from space exploration, link in the description. 
We also talked about spin-off technologies from space exploration in this video here. With surprising technologies such as cardiac pacemakers, landmine removal devices, cloud computing or even insulating foam being direct products of space exploration. Therefore exploring space does have direct implications for life here on Earth, potentially even creating some medical devices which help to save lives. So yeah, space exploration is important on many different levels. Not only will it prevent us to be wiped out by some catastrophic event, which we are shown right now is not even so unlikely, but no, it also gives us many new technologies that make life on Earth better for all of us. So we mentioned Venera 13 as being the last probe to explore the surface of Venus. By the way, only Russian missions in the Soviet era ever touched down on that planet. And now Russia is preparing for a new robotic lander mission, but not to Venus, instead back to the moon. Russia wants to send a lander to the south pole of the moon to land there in October 2021. This would be the first Russian moon lander since Luna 24 in 1976. A continuation of a moon exploration program after 45 years is quite unusual, but absolutely amazing nonetheless. India with a Chandrayaan mission, China is already there with a Chang'e 4 on the far side and preparing for Chang'e 5 and now Russia joining in is really excellent news. We think that the moon should be our main focus and robotic exploration of the moon certainly makes a lot of sense before humans would return there in the 2020s. Now while China is really successful with their robotic moon missions, Yu-22 is still roaming around on the far side of the moon, making scientific discoveries as we speak. The first attempt to launch their new generation Long March 7A rocket unfortunately ended in failure. The rocket did manage to launch. However, the payload, a classified satellite meant for geosynchronous orbit, was lost, as the rocket wasn't able to propel the satellite into its designated orbit. This could have some negative impacts on the timeline of China's planned future space station, which should have been completed by 2022. But of course, due to this rocket failure and due to the current virus outbreak, China will certainly also face delays with their space program. But still, China intends to continue operations and rocket launches as planned in 2020. And it appears that their first Mars mission will still be launched this year as originally planned, which certainly is some good news. So do you think that this damn crisis will delay our beloved space programs, first and foremost Starship of course, but also Artemis? And if yes, by how much? One year or even two years? We're really looking forward to your estimates in the comment section. So you just watched the JS Space Report on every Monday where we tell you our opinions about the most recent developments in spaceflight and human space exploration with a strong emphasis on space politics. So thanks for turning on the show and I would say on to the future.